same time, he was a professor and I was a student more than 20 years ago. And um, actually, he was on my committee, so that was a while ago. Um, but since then, we've also written several papers together where he's the fluid model expert and I'm the person that watches the fluid model expert do that kind of stuff. Um, he got his PhD at the University of Illinois um, under Sean Mine of the University of Florida. And he's from Toronto, where he went to undergrad and master's degree. And now he's working at Hamilton and, um, in Hamilton, Ontario, at the Master University in Computing and Software uh, Department. So as I say, he's an expert in queues and scaling of queuing stochastic models to get fluid approximations. Yeah, and he's not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> so there you go. In issue where it's definitely not a heterogeneous service. OK, next part. So, um, <clears throat> So let me plunge right into it. So the first thing I'm going to do is just a little bit of a uh, little bit of advertising. So uh, so this uh, I'm generally interested in uh, problems for the last few years that are arise from uh, scheduling in, in data centers. And so this what I'm going to show you is a um, is essentially a stylized problem that's motivated by this. So. Um, I'm the academic, acting academic director of the Computing Infrastructure Research Center, and we do these kind of things in uh, in, in data center design. So we're looking. We have uh, uh, six or seven faculty members and about uh, thirty odd graduate students that are that are working on various uh, problems in this domain. So. So, um, so let me tell you. So, I'm interested in uh, in workload assignment in this domain. So, workload assignment is that I have a number of servers and I have incoming jobs that I want to uh, uh, assign to these servers. So, for people that are familiar with queuing, it's, it is a kind of queuing model. But let me just tell you some of the considerations that tend to be involved. So. I'm interested in uh, performance considerations, so you can think of that as, as paying costs that are proportional, proportional to how long a job stays in the system, so kind of response time uh, considerations. Um, there's energy considerations, which are the cost for using a server, and also um, well, the cost for using a server, this is how much energy is used. And there's a third component, which so a lot of the queuing literature considers these two things, and this is also what I'll be talking about. But if I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some current problems that we're working at, working on in terms of thermal considerations. So the one of the issues is that we could have a straightforward scheduling problem here, but one of the things is that servers, uh, this is maybe why this room is so cold, but servers tend to heat up a room but we cannot allow them to overheat uh, for a couple of reasons. A big one is that if I allow a server to overheat, its lifetime is decreased. But there's also the cost of actually cooling the server. So, so I might have to use more air conditioning to, uh, to cool hotter servers. So just motivation, but now I'm gonna state a more uh, abstract problem that talks about the, the trade-off between these first two. So let me, I want to, let me just put a picture up of, uh, of this so that it stays. Uh, Uh, um, a system with uh, S servers in parallel. So this is a, a stochastic problem. So I have service times are independent and exponentially distributed with rate mu j on, on server j. Um, you can also think that uh, the service times, well, let's, let's leave it at that. So a job being processed by server j incurs a usage cost of rate beta j. While in the system, jobs incur holding cost at rate h. 
And suppose that I have uh, initially just n jobs that need to be processed. Okay, so I have this, this pool of n jobs that are kind of in a common pool, and I want to assign this to these, uh, these servers. And the goal is to just simply minimize the total expected cost until all jobs are, are processed. So for example, if I knew the, if I didn't have the stochastic element to it, this is just a form of a, of a job shop scheduling problem with, with usage cost, but the stochastic element is, is maybe a little bit different. So there's various versions of this problem which I'll touch on. So jobs may or may not be reassigned. So, so initial problem is once I assign a job to a, a server, uh, for example, if I, in particular, if I assign it to a slow server or one that's expensive, and another server that I might like better becomes free, I can't reassign it. Or there's a version where I could shuffle things around. Okay. Uh, so, just it's a fairly simple model, but just is there, is there any questions just on the on the model itself here? So where is energy here? So energy is in this is in this usage cost. So so okay. this this beta that I'm paying is the uh, <coughs> amount of the, the, okay. the amount that I'm paying for energy, and, and so I'm only paying this cost beta when I'm processing uh, when I'm processing one of these jobs. So if I you know it's kind of a simplistic assumption, but if I don't assign anything to uh, to a server, then I'm paying zero at, at that point. So. The, uh, the, the second model that we consider is, is one that's the same as this clearing system, but instead now it's, uh, it's an online. So the first one you can think is an offline problem, the second one is an online problem, that uh, now I have arrivals occur, and of course I need to assume that the arrival rate is less than the, total, the sum of all of these uh, service rates in order for the queue length not to blow up. Yeah? In both models, are you allowed to work on the same job simultaneously? Or so jobs are indivisible. Okay. Uh, so I can only uh, so there's no there's no possibility to to, para, to do these jobs you know parallelize these. So either you can't break it into pieces, and also you can't uh, you can't replicate the job over 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 multiple servers. Uh, so it's it's completely so. As I said, this is kind of a, a stylized problem that captures some of these issues, but you can think of in, in a practical situation you want to consider these extra extra possibilities. So what happens if the job arrives and all the servers are doing? So there's a sorry, there's a, there's an infinite queue that they can wait in. Okay. So this is a, this is a multi-server queue uh, that if also so but you might also have, you know, the solution to this problem might be that uh, you might want to have the jobs wait in the queue even if some of the servers are, uh, are idle. So there's, there's no, no cost to having them wait in the queue. Okay, there's the a queue. holding cost. Oh, there is a holding cost. Yes, so, so I'm going to pay the holding cost, but it could be, for example, that, that, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but it could be the case that one of these servers is so expensive that I only want to use it when I get in, in a very bad condition of the system, right? So, so there's no, there's no notion here in this case that uh, I want to enforce that the servers uh, never idle if they have something to do. So I, I allow idle. So one of the things that makes this problem interesting is to even think about the problem where, let's suppose that there are no usage costs at all, that there's only, uh, that there's only holding costs. So there's a, this, oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me just, so the potential applications here, my apologies. Um, so, maybe I won't spend too much uh, time on this, but one of the things is that uh, in this particular cloud computing applications, different instances have different processing rates, so there's naturally potentially some heterogeneity. I can pay for, if I go on Amazon Web Services, for example, I can pay for a more powerful uh, instance, uh, but I correspondingly pay. So, so we could have those kind of applications. So the reason why this is interesting, so um, there's kind of a, a well-known problem in, in queuing called the slow server problem. 
And so one of the issues here is that if I restrict myself to only having two servers, <laughs> it's well known that a threshold policy is optimal. So I only use the slow server once the number of waiting jobs becomes larger than some threshold. Okay, so it's kind of a natural thing. You only want to use the slow server if things get sufficiently bad. So back in 1984, this was shown for the uh, case where uh, there, it's a clearing system where there's no arrivals. Um, for arrivals with the, uh, with the two server, this has been proved many times using different approaches. A dynamic programming approach, a sample path approach. Uh, comparing individually and socially optimal policies in a Martingale approach. And there's been several extensions to this. But as soon as I go from uh, two to three servers, it becomes much more difficult. And in fact, it's still an open problem for, for it to be shown that a threshold policy is optimal for this, for this setting. So, um, and there's been a couple of attempts. I, I, I really prefer not to put the names of the papers up there, but uh, there's been a couple, if you're interested, there's a couple attempts at this where there's been uh, problems in the proofs uh, for this. So um, I'll show you the example in a minute because it's a little bit strange. So Weber in 1993 did show, uh, so he gave an example, if a threshold policy is optimal, the threshold depends on the state of other servers. So in other words, a simple threshold that just says, up to a certain point, use the fastest server, up to the next point, use the next fastest server, up to the next point, use the next fastest server, it can't be, is not optimal in general. And so there's a really weird uh, uh, example. So I just want to put this not because you uh, uh, want to under understand these particular numbers, but is to emphasize that the, uh, it's not easy to find such examples. So, uh, so they constructed an example with, uh, with arrivals. So the arrival, there's three servers. This is the arrival rate and the three processing rates. And there's two, uh, there's two possibilities here. So one job is waiting to be assigned to a server. So there's one sitting in the queue. And only the fastest server is busy it's optimal to just let the job wait in the queue. However, if the slowest server happens to be busy, so I'm not allowed to reassign the jobs, if the slowest server is busy, it actually becomes optimal to assign that job to the second slowest server. I don't think that anybody has any intuition for why this is actually the, the case. It comes out from looking at a dynamic programming problem and actually seeing that this uh, has this structure. So this threshold, if it exists, is complicated. It's a threshold that's not only on the number of jobs in the queue, um, it seems to depend on the other servers. And you think if I have uh, 100 servers, this threshold can become very sort of combinatorially complicated. So, Weber shows that if an assignment is made, so if you actually make an assignment, then it's always made to the fastest server. So that's if you make an assignment. The problem is it doesn't tell you whether to make an assignment or not for, for a waiting job. So one of the things is that for people that are interested in these kind of problems, there's this nice open problem of actually showing that, this, uh, that the threshold policy works for this particular setting. So forget, forget adding these, uh, these usage costs. If I only have these, uh, these service rates, then there's still this problematic behavior. And people don't understand exactly why it, uh, why it occurs. Okay. In the example you just showed, is reassignment allowed or no. disallowed? No. So uh, you know, essentially, the problem here uh, goes away if I'm, if I'm allowed to do reassignment. So and I think that if I do reassignment, then uh, if I remember right, then just a simple threshold policy is, is, is optimal in that case. Because that I mean I can always uh, I can always make sure that the uh, so one of the issues is 
you know, I can always make sure that with reassignment, I can always make sure the fastest business server is busy. Without without reassignment, you know, the question is, there's kind of a trade-off between keeping the fastest server busy and what I do with the what I do with the other ones. Um, so that's cut. Kind of, that's a little bit of the intuition for this is that. This one, because of the one waiting job and only one server is busy, I want to wait on the chance that the fastest server becomes busy. But as soon as more servers start becoming busy, I don't want things to wait. But exactly what the trade-offs are is not well understood. Is the server assigned like at the moment where uh, the job enters the queue, or so? Um, so if you add routing to the problem so that you need to make a decision immediately upon, uh, upon arrival, I think you have, I th I'm not 100% sure, but I th I'm pretty sure that you have similar uh, issues is that your routing, uh, your routing decision will depend on the, uh, will not just depend on the, uh, the, the so now, your routing decision, you'd have to look at all, you'd have individual queues for individual servers. So your routing uh, uh, problem would depend not just on the individual queue lengths, but they would depend on the, the actual, whether the servers were busy or not. So, sorry, but that doesn't, that incorporates the queue lengths. So, but it, the threshold policy would be, um, I don't know, it'd be fairly complicated, I think, but, uh, but maybe I, for fear of saying something ridiculous, uh, maybe I better not say more about that. Yeah. Well, for your model, there's, there's no routing question. There's no routing question. So, so they're just sitting in a queue, and then when a server can become an uh, idle, you decide whether or not you want to send the job to that server. Or yeah, so, the other, uh, server. so basically the decision is that, yeah, when, you know, when a server becomes idle, uh, do I want it to grab one of these jobs or, or, or not? Okay. Uh, that's essentially it in, in both problems. Right. Right. So, let, I'm, I'm going to give you kind of an idea of the results here. Uh, so, one of the uh, so the way we're going to solve this problem is that we're going to look at individual optimality versus uh, socially optimal. So socially optimal is trying to overall minimize the expected cost. And the individual op individually optimal policy is that each, each job tries to minimize its own cost. Okay, so you can think that that's a kind of greedy policy. So the one nice thing that happens in this problem is that we can show first that the individual, uh, individually optimal policy is a threshold type. So uh, a particular job uses a, a particular server. So for this is the clearing system, uh, just according to a, a, a threshold, depending on where it is in, in the, the queue, we're going to show that the individually and the social, socially optimal policies are the same, which is actually kind of a rare event for these kind of, uh, these kind of systems that social and individually optimal coincide. And one nice thing about this is that this whole thing in terms of these techniques, you know, I think if you're, one of the things is that this particular problem I could set up as a dynamic programming problem. But this turns out to be easier than directly doing dynamic pro programming and it has the nice uh, side effect that we can actually explicitly calculate what these thresholds are for arbitrary parameters. Okay, so the, the thresholds for using each of the servers, which is something that one, it's certainly much more difficult to do with the dynamic programming. You tend to get more structural results on these things. So, um, let me first say, so an initial result, so I say that server J is preferred to server K. So that means if, if, one, if there's only one job in the system, and all the servers were free, which is the preferred server to use? Well, you can just think the over the life, the expected lifetime of a job, which is one over mu j of server j, I pay 
at rate h plus beta j, so I get the um, I get this relation between these two things. So, uh, so the, per, per, the lowest cost per job while it's being processed is server j of this holds. This is this is almost obvious. Uh, so this is just the cost of using a particular server. So the nice thing about this expression, even though it's almost obvious, is it captures the trade-off of the two quantities of holding costs the, the, and the usage costs. So the, hold, the holding cost of the amount of time that I at least spend being processed and the amount that I pay for being, uh, for being used. So the question is, um, in general, do we have this, this kind of preference in particular? I'll talk about the online world. But this is, this is just, uh, as I said, this is if there's only one job in the system. Okay, but now I need, to, I need to look at when there's more than one job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, so if I use this relation to index the servers, so in other words, uh, you know, server one is the one with the lowest one of, of this quantity, server two is the next lowest. So without reassignment or arrivals, the individual optimal policy is threshold type. So if this J server is available, server with the lowest index, it will be used by job TJ. And TJ is, so if I just arbitrarily order these, then I get this, uh, this way of calculating the threshold. So it's recursive in that the, uh, the threshold for using the first server is, is, uh, is uh, one in this case, so I always use the first server. Um, and then I can calculate the thresholds by these quantities. And this is really just the, the the proof of this is not particularly uh, I, I guess it's not particularly exciting. It's just kind of a a recursive proof of calculating uh, the cost of the second job using you know either okay. server one or waiting for server one to finish or using server two. So you can just build up this recursion. But the nice thing about it is for the individually optimal policy. It's straightforward to calculate these uh, these thresholds to use these servers. Okay, so it's it's not so important what these formulas are, but but the idea is that we can actually calculate these things. So the key thing is this: that, that when I'm doing this calculation, the threshold thresholds are the points at which choosing a free server is better than waiting for all of the other jobs on lower index servers. But, you know, if I just look at these, so they come from this, but it's hard to look at those thresholds and expressions and just sort of say, yeah, those, those make sense. So it's interesting that the, the problem without reassignment is in some sense uh, easier than the problem with reassignment. So, and that's partly because the, uh, the, the, the possibilities become more complicated in the problem with reassignment because in the problem without reassignment, the decision that I make is an all or nothing decision. I join the server or, or not. With reassignment is I have the ability, for example, if server one, which is the best server, is busy, I can make a decision to join server two, and I might still get the opportunity to join server one if it finishes. So in some sense, it becomes combinatorially more uh, complicated. If there's no cost for transferring or no. Nope. Yeah, so again, simplified, there's no, there's no cost, and it takes zero time to transfer uh, transfer between these things. So it would seem to me that you would just keep shifting things down to the best server. Well, but this is this is exactly you know the, you, you get these recursions that are uh, you know the cost for if I am, if I'm the second job in the so if I look at this uh, this setting two jobs and three servers so job one 
always chooses the best server. Yep. And then job two, you just go through the possibilities. So the cost for waiting for, for server one, if I wait, is, is this. I have to wait for server one to finish, uh, the, the current one, plus the time to, to process things, plus uh, you know, the usage cost divided by the, the, the processing time. So this is the cost per, for serving that, per, for that job. But now the cost for waiting for uh, server two becomes a little more complicated because now I have cases if, if I assign it to this one, there's a possibility that I finish here first or this one finishes first and I shift over to, the, to that one. The waiting time could be longer. Here, here in three, you could wait longer because you may actually, actually wait for, well, if you did my waiting one, you can wait for several of them to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this case, there's only this this example. There's only uh, you know with two jobs and three servers. So, but you can think that now if I have uh, many many jobs, it becomes the, the possibilities become more complicated than making a simple uh, a simple all or nothing assignment. And the cost for uh, um, so the interesting thing about this, the cost for waiting for the third server in this case, which is the one that's the least preferred. So this is the term for the expected cost for, for waiting for the fastest server to be free. This is assigning it to the second best server. And it turns out that in this case, assigning it to the third best server is preferred. And again, it, it partly comes from the fact that if I assign it to the, uh, if I assign it to the worst server, it becomes more likely that I use the faster server somehow. And so I, I kind of hedge my bets to say, well, I'll take a chance on this one. But it's, it, so it's, it's the, the trade-offs are really hard to, uh, uh, to get exactly. But in this calculation, one of the problems is, is that I have this now 2H term. So as I said, it becomes a little bit complicated. So the third server is preferred. So in comparison to the problem without reassignment, so a problem without reassignment, you first decide, you first decide whether you want to be with the best server in isolation. Then you decide you know, whether you want to be with the next best or the next best and so on. With reassignment, you might actually not prefer to be with the next best server. So the nice thing about this is that for arbitrary number of uh, jobs, we're actually able to calculate these, again, these thresholds uh, um, here. But instead of sequentially looking through the servers, you have to uh, look at this, uh, this kind of min-max problem. So you kind of, it's again a bit combinatorial that you're looking through all of the possibilities of where you'll assign things and looking at what's the best case in terms of greedily optimizing your, uh, your cost. Okay. So there's not a lot of, again, not a lot of depth in this. Okay, so that's calculating individually optimal policy. This, this is the greedy policy that every job, so the first job decides on where it wants to go, the second job, and so forth. But what we're, what we're interested in is a policy that, that minimizes the overall cost for the system. So the sum of all of the costs of the, uh, of the individual, uh, individual jobs. So there's a result from back in the 80s uh, that says that if the social optimal policy can be implemented by each job implementing some individual policy, and if under that individual policy, job never utilizes a previously declined server, then that individual policy is in fact individually optimal, so even with arrivals. So in other words, if I can get the decisions of these, uh, the decisions of these jobs to correspond to each other in the individually in the socially optimal policy, then they're equivalent to each other. And the key thing here, so uh, I'll tell you, that, um, that what happens is, so 
this actually becomes uh, becomes almost immediate. Immediate. So this. So there's a proof that's by backwards induction. And if we consider a policy that differs from the individually optimal policy in only the first decision. But now we're going to change that first decision only for the last job n. So we're going to look at the, we're going to make that first decision actually correspond to the last job. And the key behind that is that it doesn't matter what order I do these jobs in. And it doesn't matter what order I do these in, so this is the one place where the exponential distribution is, uh, is, is important here because I don't need to know any history of my assignments. So the last job has no effect on any of the other jobs. And the last job is always better of following its individually optimal policy. So in this case, the individually optimal policy must be social, socially optimal. So this proof is like, there's a number of other proofs where in, in other settings that, that follow this, is that for a, um, a number of uh, queuing problems, especially with when I have these exponential uh, assumptions, essentially this corresponds to the expected cost being independent of the order in which I serve these things. So in, in other words, it's like last come, serving the last one first is the same as choosing things in first come, first serve. So th this is, um, I'm not sure it's a little bit cryptic, but, but it turns out that this proof is, uh, is a very, very short proof. So just something. Are you allowed to reassign? Maybe you couldn't maybe do that. Oh, I see. Maybe you know, if someone arrives to a system, are you allowed to reassign? Maybe you wouldn't ever do that. Yeah, if someone arrives, so you wouldn't ever do that. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, there's a couple. Uh, there's a, there's a couple of uh, um, special cases here. So if it's true that Server, so these are kind of obvious ones. If server J is less expensive than server J plus one, and server J is all also faster than, than, than uh, J plus one, then the optimal ordering in this case, so the ordering in which I look at things, is consistent with this index. But if that's not true, if it's true, and this is the more interesting case, if it's true that the uh, faster servers are more expensive, then the ordering in which I consider the servers can be different than the ordering in which I look at the servers in isolation. So the interaction of these jobs causes, uh, causes us to look at servers in different orders. And if I have uh, usage costs that are linear in the, uh, in the service rates, then the optimal ordering is also consistent with this. So, so that again, the index would be what I would prefer in isolation. Okay. So if I look now at a system with arrivals, so suppose now that arrivals um, occur according to a Poisson process with rate lambda, and now the servers are offered to jobs in this, uh, so. Um, so this LCFP is uh, last come, first preferred, or first priority. So the, the priority in terms of uh, scheduling these jobs on the servers is to the most recent arrival. But again, we're assuming this in order for this social, social optimality being equal to this individual optimality situation to hold but we know again with, with these exponential times, exponentially distributed times, that the, these expressions, the expected number in the system and the expected, uh, the expected usage cost are both independent of the actual, actual service order you use. So you can prove it for last come first serve or last come first priority um, and then if you just implement say first come first serve then you would still have the same result. So again, 
With this case, we show that with reassignment, the individual and social ed optimal policies coincide and our uh, threshold policies, so with reassignment, I'm allowed to, to reassign things when servers become idle. Unfortunately, without reassignment, we run into the slow server problem. So without reassignment, the individual and the socially optimal policies only coincide for two servers. So this is an example now where we get into the generic case that normally individual and socially optimal don't coincide, and it happens here in our setting only in the case where I don't have reassignment. So I'll say that the individually optimal policy is, uh, is threshold type. The priorities and the thresholds are to be determined. I'm going to say a few words about this, but this, uh, this proof is almost immediate. It looks like it essentially looks like the, the setting without arrivals. So again, this is the individually optimal policy. So each, uh, each arrival trying to minimize its total cost. And the individually optimal policy is also socially optimal, has a proof that's almost the same as for the, for the clearing system. It's this idea that the, le the most recent arrival is the one that, uh, that where I deviate from the from from things, and when I deviate from that, the last arrival wants to be individually optimal. So I start from socially optimal, deviate from it, and then I get this, uh, this situation. So it's a nice setting where where again I get this. But the, now there's some issues. So the problem without reassignment. Uh, is the following, and this is kind of the proof outline of the other one as well. So the individually optimal policy is threshold type and is also socially optimal. So the threshold type follows almost immediately. Uh, so for the infinite horizon, it's always preferable to use the most preferred server, otherwise you have extra costs um, in terms of if there's a choice between them. And if I deviate from the individually optimal policy for job N, and then following the individual Sorry, that should be, uh, yeah. So deviating from the individual policy for job N for the first decision, and then following the individual optimal policy hurts job N and has no effect on the other jobs. So, so the idea is that because I'm using this last come first serve, the, uh, um, I hurt this job and it doesn't have effect on, on the other jobs. So with more than two servers, essentially what happens is we have uh, a version of the, uh, of the slow server problem, um, and some interesting things happen. So if, so here's an example, at the first decision epoch, so when an arrival occurs, for example, um, I have mo the most preferred server is busy, and a policy F assigns the lowest priority job N to server 2, while well, server 2 is under idle under pi star. Unfortunately, you can't say that all the jobs have the same individual expected cost. Because, of, because uh, it's, the problem is there's not this, this, this binary choice. So if a job with lower priority is using server 3, it's affected by jobs and decisions because the idea is that job N can now kick this job out of, uh, uh, out of using server 3 or not. And so this, and when it's moved from server 3, it might move to some other server. So now things become more complicated and these, these jobs affect each other. So under pi star, so the idea of job n, so job n is the lowest priority. If it becomes job n plus 1 due to an arrival, so it becomes lower priority, and in last come first serve it can, it may want to preempt the job using server 3, but now it can't do it. So the job on server 3 is better off using this, this policy 
which is no longer individually, uh, so which is no longer socially optimal. So we have examples where this happens. So we have this scenario that's, that's essentially uh, equivalent to the slow server problem, is that what you want to do is dependent on whether the slow server is busy or not. So here's an example where if you, you do the calculations, so if I take these values of mu, so mu2 is a, is a faster server, but it has much higher cost. So what happens is, if I have a clearing system, uh, the first server is preferred, but if I now have arrivals, and we stop the system after two arrivals, the initial job in the system, so here, Again, so sorry, maybe it's a little bit clearer. There's one job in the system. Then I do my calculation of, uh, of H, H plus beta over mu. Then the first server is uh, the first server is preferred. It's cheaper to use that one. But if I do a calculation now with lambda equal two, and I just do brute force the calculations of uh, the expected, so you know, I have these random arrivals now occurring and I, and I stop the system after two arrivals. If there's an initial job in the system in this case, so the initial job uh, has free choice of servers, it actually prefers to use uh, server two in the socially optimal policy. So again, I just do the dynamic programming for this uh, and I get that it prefers server two which which we don't understand very well to be particularly uh, to, to be honest is that you know it seems though as though um, that you might want to just be at that best server to, to begin with but somehow that messes things up in the future So um, under the optimal assignment policy with reassignment for two servers, if they're ordered in this way, and if mu1 is greater than or equal to mu2, then server one is always preferred. So if, if I have a if I have a choice between uh, you know both servers are idle and I have the choice, I always prefer the one that has the best <coughs> index. But as soon as these conditions are violated, it could be the case that the preference goes the other way around. And these parameters are in violation of, of this condition. It's not required, right? Sorry? It's not required. Sufficient yeah. condition. Uh, but the inter I think the most interesting result here is that for reassignment with two servers, Either server server one, so this is the best one in uh, in isolation. Either server one is preferred for all arrival rates, or there's a threshold on the arrival rate such that for all land all arrival rates less than this threshold lambda zero, server one is preferred. But once the uh, arrival rates get sufficiently large. An arriving job that sees both servers idle prefers to go to the one that's essentially worse for it. Which again is, uh, I, I wish I had some intuition for this result, but I, but I don't. So these ones became, so in all of the above cases with the, with the, uh, with the arrivals in the system, uh, we can we can ex we can explicitly use the wrong word. We have these similar recursions for calculating the uh, the thresholds. So um, so there's recent work by uh, George Zhang that uh, so nothing to do with myself uh, have extended this work to the problem of of having uh, instead of having servers that are uh, all individually different. Uh, to work on the problem of clusters of, of servers of the same type. Uh, so this is closer to data center applications. So um, 
what I was going to do now, unless there's questions about this, was I, I just, if people are, I, I was going to switch to just tell you a little bit about a problem that we're looking at now in terms of these, uh, these thermal considerations, which I'm not going to uh, uh, do so much in terms of uh, proofs, but I can give you an idea of this. So, uh, yeah. Maybe I have a couple of questions. So I am curious to know what happens if you don't have this exponential assumption? And then I didn't see anywhere. Most of the time, you see things like uh, without the, the whole top place, you have no considerations for um, the rival rate. But at the end, there's this strong condition to require the rival rate. So do you have any interest in that? So, into, so, uh, so, the, so the, the exponential, uh, uh, so the exponential assumption comes, uh, for example, in the system with arrivals, is uh, so. I think we could do it. Uh, so the problem is, you would need to restrict things to uh, uh, last come first serve. So, so the idea is that what you can show is that um, for Doing last come first serve, the individual the individual optimality and the uh, social optimal policies coincide, and then you can say that for because under the exponential distribution, uh, it doesn't matter what policy you use, you get the same performance. So whether you use last come first serve, first come first serve, any any policy there, you get. Uh, so if you're willing to restrict yourself to last come first serve, I think you can generalize this. But the problem is that what I really want to say is that if I use, uh, you know, if the if I don't care about the ordering at which these jobs choose the server. Um, you know, so what I want to say is that if I use first come first serve, and I um, and I choose, use the thresholds in that way, then I'm still uh, then I'm still okay. Uh, so you, you lose that connection when I have uh, when when I when I move to uh, general uh, uh, service times because I know because if I have general service times, then the performance is uh, is dependent on the schedule. So that's that's a. Uh, and this uh, this strong condition is, is in some sense this strong condition is not a um, this is more a structural result than a strong condition. This just simply says that if we know that a a, a threshold policy uh, we know that a threshold policy is optimal in the two server case, but the problem is the uh, the the threshold can. The, the initial choice that you make for a server can change. So you know, instead of being, uh, so, so this says that for all lambda small enough, the threshold is on whether the Q length of one server is high enough, and then I start using the other server. And then, but what happens is when lambda comes sufficiently large, then the threshold is now on the, the other server. So this uh, so so the the previous results always said that there was a threshold policy, but you know the uh, the server that I that I that I keep busy all the time essentially is uh, it might become idle. But the server that I prefer to send uh, to a system where both servers are idle switches according to the arrival. So this is what I'm saying. I guess it's a little strange to me because in most of these scheduling problems, the arrival rate doesn't really come into play. Yeah. So, but the but the. So you're saying in this case it does. In terms of the optimal policy, yeah. Yeah. Normally, right. it doesn't mean, you know it's, it's really based on the cost of service and the speed of which it's used. So that's everything you show until this. this yeah. I don't see why. So I think that. So I think that the. Uh, um, the idea is that uh, the server two is preferred uh, means that the arrival rate is high enough uh, here that we can keep the uh, that we can keep the fast server busy all the time. 
but when the when the arrival rate is uh, when the arrival rate is low enough, we need to make sure that we keep the uh, the, the fast server busy. So in some sense, the, the arrival rate here is things kind of look after themselves in terms of keeping the, the fast server busy. And and so when it's high and when it's high enough, you don't mind always having a a, a few jobs at the slowest uh, uh, server because it kind of all um, it all comes out. Okay, so let me just spend a couple minutes on. So, uh, so one of the things is so one in our grand scheme of things, we'd really like to be able to uh, uh, look at a queuing problem, and we have. In fact, I was talking to some of the students at lunch about this, but uh, um, we lose granularity at the job level, so we replace by uh, we're going to replace things by the utilization of each server. And uh, the thermal models can be complicated. So in other words, we can have, they're not simple linear models. There can be turbulent, uh, there can be air flows in the system that, have, that show some turbulence. But I just want to give you a taste of this. So we built a thermal model for uh, this kind of setting. So, so just to give you a bit of idea of how this works. So we have a single rack of servers. So this is the uh, this is the f uh, back of the servers. This is the front of the servers. So we have fans at each of the servers pulling in uh, air from front to back. So the the cold air is is on this side, and the hot air is on this side. This R and C U is a cooling unit. So there's there's water coming into this cold water coming into this cooling unit, and fans force out cold air into here and uh, comes to the server's hot air, comes through here. Okay. So we built a thermal model that uh, looks at kind of energy balance between, uh, between these servers. So the idea is that we have a server, we look at it, it generates some heat depending on, uh, depending on its utilization, uh, and it's influenced by the server above it, and the server below it. That's all. It's you know the so the heat we have heat moving from uh, from you know servers to uh, to another here. So I'm I'm actually not an expert on these things. So we have a number of mechanical engineering people who uh, built these kind of models. So. We don't have an explicit solution for the thermal model, so it's uh, it's um, it's not linear. It's non-linear differential equations for this. Uh, so, but even worse than that, there's a combinatorial aspect. So, let me just say a couple words about that. Is that if I look back at this picture, so one of the things that people have proposed is that if I turn off a server, I can save energy. Okay, because, of, because an idle server, in this case, actually uses energy. But one of the problems that a lot of people on the, on the queuing literature have considered is that if I turn a server off, the, uh, the fans turn off on the server, and this creates a path for hot air to move from the hot side to the cold side. So what happens is, um, that things get worse in terms of, uh, uh, well, so I have a different sort of thermal profile. So the problem is that in these thermal models, there's this combinatorial aspect that if I tell you which servers are on and which servers are off, I have a thermal model. But that thermal model changes, uh, so it affects not only the power consumption, but also the, the thermal property. So. Um, as far as we can tell, uh, no work has captured this. There's lots of work on power consumption versus performance. So the reason why I want to give you a taste of this is we, we haven't fully developed um, how to solve these problems. And if people are interested, I'd love to hear uh, possibilities for, for doing this. So depending on which one you turn off, that, that's, that, that affects the, the, uh, the thermal properties of the whole system. Is that what you're saying? So yeah, I'll give you, uh, so all, I, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you one example of that, and uh, and so um, so suppose that I'm solving this problem. So don't be too worried about it. So the decision variables are uh, 
the supplied water temperature, the fan speed of the cooling unit. But so I'm, I'm controlling my cooling unit. So I'm con controlling basically how cold it makes things. And I'm controlling the utilization of the server. So I have a, a fairly simple problem here. I'm, if I have some models for power consumption, I'm minimizing the power consumption such that the sum of the utilizations of my server, so there's no queuing models here anymore, the sum of the utilization of my servers is equal to the offered demand. I might want to constrain my utilization of my service to be less than 100% for performance considerations, but that's not important. The key one is that the maximum of these TIs, which are the, the temperatures at the front of the servers, has to be less than or equal to some maximum value. The problem is that these temperatures come from solving that thermal model. So in other words, to solve this, uh, this optimization problem, I need to make a call to some routine that gives me what all the temperatures are given that I have a certain uh, uh, configuration. So I have that embedded in the optimization problem. And the problem with doing this is that if I solve this, if I turn all of the servers on, then these numbers aren't so important, but the idea is if I turn all the servers on, then the total power that the cooling system takes is just under 3,700 watts. And then the temperature, so these are the servers from, so the cooling unit is down here, so you, it m makes perfect sense that the servers, so these are server numbers, the servers that are closer to the cooling unit are cooler. And then our constraint up here is that the maximum temperature is, is less than 28. So we, we've solved an instance of this problem to solve the best values of UI minimizing the power consumption. As I said, I, I'm not telling you what some of these models are underneath, but I just want to give you a flavor. So suppose that I s decide to choose turn server 29 off. So I've I've turned one of my servers off, and I'd expect there, because all these servers uh, consume power when they're idle, it turns out that all of the, the servers consume less power. But in this case, if you notice, the, uh, the total cooling power here was 3,700, 3.7 kilowatts, and now it's over 3.8. And the big problem is that turning this server off, the one of the things you can see here is that the hottest server now isn't the one at the top, which is normally what you'd expect. The, the hottest one should be the one that's farthest away from the cooling unit. Also, hot air rises, so, uh, so, so you would expect the one at the top to be there. But now, this one being off has disturbed the airflow enough and caused issues that this one becomes the hottest one, and I need to cool things down even more. But if I choose, uh, if I turn server five off, one that's closer to the, the cooling unit, then my total cooling power is now reduced. So in one case, turning one of the servers off, I make things worse in terms of what I need to do to cool the system, and if I turn a different one off, I make things better in terms of uh, reducing the power consumption. So this is an observation that, as again, in the, on the more CS side, this is an observation that hasn't been made, but I'll end with, we have a big problem in trying to figure out how to, uh, how to actually efficiently solve this optimization problem. Because the, to try to solve this, we would like to be able to, uh, to essentially also choose which of the servers are, are on and off. And this, this kind of discrete nature of, of this means that this thermal model seems to change rather drastically. If I look at these two pictures, uh, seems to change rather drastically depending on which server that I turn off. And so 
we don't have a very good feel for how to explore, efficiently explore the solution space for this problem because we'd like it to scale up beyond 30 servers in order to solve that. So if, if anybody, I mean, maybe it's too vaguely described, but if, if, if people are interested in that, I'd love to hear uh, ideas about it.